The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability explicit or implied shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome to Life with Open Pages Publishing. We all have a purpose in life. Sometimes we just need a little motivation to point us in the right direction. This show is designed to help you create the life you were meant to live. I'm your host, Michelle Svikanis. My goal is to motivate you to make simple life changes so you can experience a life with meaning, direction, love, and peace. Now let's start the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Life with Open Pages. Uh, Tonight we're going to be talking about five secrets to happiness only Southerners know. Now, as many Yankees may have noticed, Southern folks have a unique, laid-back charm, colorful ways of expressing themselves, and a deep love of humor. My guest, Jane Jenkins Herlong, a former Miss America contestant, best-selling author and humorist, will enlighten us on what it takes to be happy or be happier by emulating our Southern kinfolks. Jane says, we hold on to our traditions like we grip moon pies. Welcome to the show, Jane Jenkins Herlong. Oh, thank you, Michelle. I love listening to all the the bumper info too. Yeah, I'm all about that. Got to live your best life. You really do. Intentionally find it, right? That's great. For sure, sure. So tell us about yourself. Well, I was reared, my daddy and mama said, don't say raise because we raise crops and we rear children. Uh, down on John's Island, which is a big old island actually outside of Charleston. And my daddy was a tomato and cucumber farmer. And I just loved playing in the fields. I was a tomboy. And um, I had, you know, lost my teeth like most uh, little children will do and just felt super ugly with short hair and big lips and the whole deal. But I was a big dreamer and I just loved being the tomboy and uh, doing interesting things and imagination grew. We lived down a long dirt road and lots of great things can happen down a long dirt road. You learn a lot about life. You learn about death. You learn about taking care of your neighbors. It was a really sweet childhood. It was. I could ride my bicycle. Um, couple of tenths of a mile not too far to visit my grandparents who were raised on uh, Abapula Creek, had a house down there where they had six children. So it was a really fun childhood at the time. You didn't realize how special it was until that part passed by and you could reflect back. But that was a a good good time for me and uh, went on to um, struggled in school. Uh, My IQ's low found that out in first grade and uh, wanted to be in a little beauty pageant, got laughed at, didn't get picked. Of course, the little diva girl got picked. So um, I think all of that was interesting to me looking into that world of being better. And it started with me with just being rejected from that little girl beauty pageant. So eventually I worked hard and did the best I could do and be the best I could be in polishing those skills and went all the way to Miss America, which was a tremendous opportunity. And that was a Miss America was super duper fun. I'm so sure it's fun now, but yeah. you know. <laughs> now you were Miss South Carolina in I 1979. Was. And I wow, was. beautiful. Wow. That's well, that was just a game changer for me <laughs> because, you know, a lot of people look at Patrick's Michelle and think, eh, you know, they're out. Well, it's competition, it's self-improvement. It's getting in touch with the best part of you. It's like getting a PhD and learning how to communicate. A lot of life skills. I have a whole speech and I call it, you can't put high heels on a Holstein cow. And it's about a girl I know of that milked a cow in a beauty pageant. Oh and it's funny. So I take that opening when I, and I speak, that's my big thing is speaking as a Southern humorist. And so I just use that in that particular speech and just talk about all the skills I learned from the Miss America program. And it really is a great thing to learn about you and learn how to be, you know, uh, poise, learn how to communicate. I mentioned that develop a talent. It doesn't have to be a performing talent. It can be baking a cake. You know, it could be all kinds of things. It could be great things like that. Have a sense of style. 
Um, learn what looks good on you. Learn what looks crummy on you. Take care of yourself. That's swimsuit. That's lifestyle and fitness. So there are a lot of takeaways from that program. I think are very relevant. Sure. So what was your talent in that program? I was singer. Okay. Uh, I did a vocal medley and uh, I love to sing even to this day. I think when God gives you a talent, keep it and, and polish it. I sang yesterday actually just for a friend of mine who's 80 years old who wow. married my 80 year old friend. I sang in their wedding and he spoke at a, a small church here in, in our little town of Johnston. And I was able to sing for them and people were so sweet and complimentary. You still got it, girl. I'm going good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, still, I still want it. You know, I still, yeah. so I keep improving that part, you know, and I'm doing comedy shows now, which is a lot of fun. So oh, I get to sing more. So I'm just doing little shows, little theaters, and hopefully that'll turn into big stuff. We'll see. Just, I, I, you know, Michelle, what we do, and you're an author, 16 books. Um, we're, we throw noodles. We're noodle throwers, and we just see right. what sticks. Sure, sure. Yeah. I got a pretty big wall. So <laughs> and I <laughs> that's feel. a good thing. Yeah, you keep throwing the noodles. Right, right. So, okay, so you're humorous. So how is Southern humor unique and different? We... Some Southern stories, they almost sound like you got to be kidding. They, and I, I don't know what it is. When I hear people start telling Southern stories and they have a, like a, a, a rhyme, a rhythm, almost a cadence, a sing song almost. My granddaddy was a storyteller, but he spoke low country, South Carolina, gala. So that's a whole different. Are you familiar with that, Michelle? I'm not. Not really. Well, I mean, I've listened to enough Gullah recordings, but like my granddaddy would say, we're going to the vegetable garden and I'm going to grow some meters and oh. cooks. And then I remember he took some vegetables to our minister one time and it was noon. It was the Episcopal church minister where we went, went to church and he knocked on the door and nobody answered. And later he said, Captain, I brought you some vegetables from a garden. And the minister, Mr. Gary, God bless him, he's a great man. He said, well, Mr. Jenkins, my wife and I were in noon prayer. And Goopa said, well, you show sure hell, praise yourself out of some good vegetables. <laughs> so that's just, you know, one little story. Daddy, uh, we had a male cat and the cat was getting neutered. And daddy had one of his helpers on the farm hold the male cat to take it to the vet. And daddy said the whole way there, Lab, what, that was his name, his cradle name. He was stroking the male cat going, great God, kitten, I'm sure glad I ain't you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I love stories. I collect stories. And there's, there are some little nuggets to me in each story. And when I wrote this new book that's coming out March the 8th of 2022, I pulled a lot of those stories into it, Southern humor stories, things that I learned growing up in Charleston that might seem over the top, but normally Southern stories. I mean, I, when I do my comedy show, I start out by singing that little Andy and Mayberry song that, you know, made my children watch. You're going to learn how to be good. <laughs> and so my good friend Margaret and I do these shows together and she actually wrote words to that song. So then I talk about what you hear on a front porch growing up in the South. And it might be stories about cousin Bob and cousin Elizabeth that lived down on the creek and a robber broke in and put the gun at Bob's uh, Elizabeth's head and said, uh, what's your name? And she said, Elizabeth. He said, well, I can't kid. That was my mama's name. Then he put the gun at Bob's head and said, what's your name? He said, Bob, but my friends call me Elizabeth. So, you know, crazy stuff like that. You might hear Cutting Teta. I love Cutting Teta, my mm -hmm. relative. And she taught school for 42 years. And a parent was angry at her at the end of her career and came up to her and said, Lady, I got a good mind to knock your teeth down your throat. And Cutting Teta said, huh, I'll save you the trouble. She's took out her dentures. <laughs> so that, and so then I segue sure. that into stuff like, you know, how do you handle things that you can't control? And so that is just a little funny, ha ha, but a life takeaway too. So that those are the kinds of things, Michelle, I like to collect. Southern mm -hmm. humor stories. A lot of people think it's therapy. You just say, um, I tell you what, you know, and you're supposed to know what, what is. And people just right. start telling stories. Sure. 
we had a lot of that growing up as well. Um, I know sometimes, you know, a lot of times I go to North Carolina to visit my family and we all have to sit on the front porch and talk about what we're going to do for the day. And that seems to be pretty popular up there because you see a lot of people sitting on the front porch. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, and it, it's just a place like, I mean, my grandmother one time said, get in the car. It was Sunday after church. You go feed, you go see your relatives. So oh, we yes. all pile in the car and go to this old looking house with no yard, no paint on the house. And these two angry looking women are sitting in rockers with <laughs> sash shoes, I guess. And house dresses and their hair is in bun, you know, and they got their old glasses on. Right. And, you know, and it was, there's no kidding. I met my cousin Wee Wee and my aunt Fanny. Oh my. So, I mean, just, <laughs> and so they just start talking and telling stories and it was fascinating. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So what are some Southern secrets uh, to help folks understand the Southern ways? I know you kind of, you know, said some things in the story that you just did, but what are some others? Well, I guess the, some of the things that we would consider and the nuances in the South is like, I hate to even tell this. It was a funeral a couple of weeks ago. And I have a good friend who's very Southern, very ladylike. And there was another woman that we knew there and her dress was just extremely short. And she was a little bit up there to be wearing a dress that short, especially a funeral. So all we, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, Lord, forgive me. I'm staring at her dress, just mm -hmm. thinking, what are you thinking? You know, mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of listening to the service. And, and I just happened to glance at my friend Dixie and we just spoke eyeball to eyeball. We knew exactly what each other was thinking. We were both think, thinking the exact same thing. But I think um, when it comes to the South, we are people that are proud of who we are. Mm -hmm. We love to share our our bounty we love to entertain we love we don't like to be judged i think right. and we like to be embraced and we like to embrace other people now a lot of mm -hmm. southerners are stuck in their ways like the old church mule i talk about the church mule mm -hmm. but they're stuck but a lot of people just like my good friend and, and cousin is building a beautiful home down in Myrtle Beach. Well, there are a lot of people from the north that have moved there trying to yeah. escape a bunch of the northern stuff. You know, we love them, but just don't bring the stuff you tried to run from to us because we, we don't like it. You know, we don't like all that. Right. Just love us and we'll love you. And I've been out to eat with several, several times with these different friends. And I think the biggest secret is let's just love each other and celebrate our diversity and our uniquenesses. And don't think we're weird or backwards or just let's be fascinated with each other's culture and let's appreciate it. Sure. You know, I, I see in, in dealing with different people that if you have any kind of Southern draw, that you may not be considered as intelligent as someone, you know, who, who doesn't have that. Um, and at times I tell you, you really got to watch the Southerners because, you know, they have their own little language too, like you said. And, you know, a lot of times when people say, bless your heart. Yeah. That's not what they really mean. <laughs> no, I tell you what step up would be God love you. Oh, God love you. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And I, you know, I've always heard, you know, when someone opens their mouths and they're a Southerner, they're, the IQ and other people's opinion goes down 20 points. Mm -hmm. Well, mine can go down as low as they want it. Just hand me that check when I leave that speech. I'll just be a, so, I mean, I, I feel like the more North I go, the more Southern I get because people really are fascinated with the South. And I, I've been doing some programs in a town not too far from here where a lot of Northerners are. And I did a women's luncheon and they all, all the women from the North, Oh, we, Oh girl, we just love what you said. We think you're fabulous. And they were, you know, all from New York and they were, they were fascinated with it. My new speech is called sweet tea secrets from the deep fried South. And so based oh, on the book, so mm -hmm. I just go into all the nuances of the South and the porch and the kinfolk and the, you know, what we celebrate, our faith, our family, our friends, we have fun, we have festivals and we're people of spirit. And I go through all of that and just tell stories. And I'm a singer too. So I drop in music. So it's fun. Right. Right. Yeah. Y'all need to make sure to go to her website because you can see some of her clips of her singing. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we talked about the Lord blesses us, blesses us with gifts. 
and you know sometimes more than one what is your main gift that you feel that god has really blessed you with you know michelle that's a good question because i think other people will tell you that if you when things happen and i've got a very dear friend and she lives outside of charleston in mount pleasant and I, I, she's just one of my dearest. And she always says to me, that just makes me very humbled. And she says, Jane, you have a big heart of forgiveness. And I am very proud that God has blessed me with a heart to forgive and not let things just pull me down. So I'm thankful for that. So I think when you love people and you don't judge people and then you look behind that person to see maybe why that person is like that. And they might need encouragement. They might need correction, you know, and you pray for them. And when I hear that, that means a lot to me because I've had to do a lot of that, a lot of forgiving and not be gripped with anger and bitterness um, through my growing up years. And even went to a therapist at one time. It was, it was very, that's what my, my third book is about called bury me with my pearls. Although it's Southern humor, I lost my mm -hmm. mom and there was a lot of family stuff going on. That was very heartbreaking. And then my sister passed away. And so all of that happened within a five month period. And I just had to ask God to take the stinger out and help me forgive people and not be pulled down. I call it, don't be like crabs in a bucket. And I know you know what that is because you're from, the, you. if you go yeah. to the beach. So <laughs> crabs right. don't want the other one to get out of the bucket and they keep pulling you down. Well, you know, get out that bucket. And, and That's right. Live the best life you can and help other people deal with maybe what they're dealing with. So that's that's kind of what other people have said to me. And I, I'm real good with rejection. Uh, I've had it so many times. <laughs> you know, when you write, you know what I'm talking about. Sure. And when you pitch your book out, you get a review and you go, what? That's a good book. You know, why would they say that? So and then you call people and no, we don't want you or, you know, we don't want to hear you or blah, blah. And you, you get pretty good with it. So you just go. I tell everybody the best four letter word in the English language is next. You yes. Know? Next. <laughs> well, I have learned that no just means not right now. I, I, I won't take no for an answer. I just, you know, it's going to be just not right now. It's just not meant for right now. So in going back to, you know, like you said, you, you open your mouth, you have a Southern draw and your IQ goes down 20 points. Um, <laughs> what is the biggest lie? Uh, that others believe about the South? I I hate to say it. I think a lot of people, maybe in the, in the in it, it was in my book, my, my agent made me take it out, but I wrote all about the black community. And it was during summer before last when I was pulling all the, you know, it takes a long time to get a book, you know, mm -hmm. done. <laughs> and he said, oh no, you need to take that out. I went, no, that's my family. Mm -hmm. I, I love these people. I learned so much. Tootsie, helped us in our house. She was like, she was my, my other mother for 50 years. She, I loved her. I have to write about her. And mm -hmm. then Wilhelmina and Wilhelmina helped us when my sister was a little girl and we love Wilhelmina. We called her Mina and she mm -hmm. and her husband, daddy built them a home um, at the gap of our road. Cause they were burned out and her husband got intoxicated and he was, I just hate to say it. He was abusive and he mm -hmm. shot her. Oh and she just said, I'm not, and she survived, but she moved to New Jersey and divorced him. And when I was sharing that with a, a friend of mine, who's very good, Eddie Jones, who would look at my, my work and say, add this line, Jane. And when he showed the line, I went, oh, that is so good. I'll never not write another book without his eyes. He would just, he saw stuff I didn't see. And so he said, put in there before there was hashtag me too. Yeah. In my life, there was Mina. She taught me, do not put up with abuse. That's what a great. beautiful story. So my agent said, take it out. I did, but I put it back in. Good. And I sent it. And they love it. They love it at Tyndall House because there were so many beautiful takeaways from the African-American slash black community that taught me a beautiful style of really worship. And they love the Lord. And that was just so special to me. So it's just, I don't, I just 
you know, I don't like people thinking blanket. We're all the same in that venue because there's a lot of richness. And my granddaddy was very, very close to a lot of the black folks that farmed and helped him farm. And my daddy too. I mean, I'll go to the, my good friend, Anna, I'll go, she has a store down on river road down from the house and I'll see so many of these guys that work for my daddy and we have the best time to reminiscing. And Michelle, I'm going to take a million for that. I'm just telling you, that's dear to me. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. Now I want to go back to uh, for a minute to your, your pageant days. Um, in 1979, you were Miss South Carolina. What did you learn? Cause I, you surfed for like a year, right? Um, so yes. what did you learn during that year? I think I learned a lot about myself. I, it was an uncomfortable mm -hmm. slash new way of life, but it was extremely comfortable to me because I mm -hmm. met people from all walks of life and I was able to learn how to really be a good speaker. I learned how to reach out and pull people into my world. They might think, oh, she's a beauty queen, but I'm just the most down-home person you'll ever meet. My parents preach that to me forever. Just be yourself. Just mm -hmm. be the best version of yourself. So right. you have to cut through that stigma. I do it today as the as the keynote speaker or the the comedy performance person because my comedy is on Sirius XM. A lot of people think, oh, you're that kind of person. So the challenge is to break through all of that and just say, listen, I'm just like you. I just tried something. It worked. I've tried a lot of stuff that didn't work. So I kind of had to learn to learn how to relate to people. And but I loved it. And it was a very natural fit for me. It was not difficult at all. That's great. So a lot of people, they look at beauty queens and everybody has a different opinion of a beauty queen and you don't know what they go through behind the scenes. And you've seen some movies on TV that highlight, you know, beauty queens and stuff. Um, but so, so how do you defend being a Southern beauty queen? Well, if you want to be successful in life, and, and, I'm, and I touched on this, the first thing you have to do is learn to communicate and communicate well. I have helped young women. I don't do that for pay. You know, I just, they'll come to my house and say, Jane, can you help me in interview? And they didn't win, but goodness later in life, they won even bigger prizes, which was incredible jobs. Because Michelle, they learn how to talk to people in interview. I've had girls say that the interviewee stopped and said, whoa, where'd you learn how to do this? Oh, wow. Well, I was in the, in the Miss South Carolina program or I was in my daughter was in outstanding what is it America's outstanding young woman that program so mm -hmm. distinguished young woman so Caroline learned about interview skills she's a great communicator that child is wonder I'm so proud that she is so even though you don't get the crown you get the opportunity mm -hmm. to learn so much about yourself so that's one thing and then we all should be taking care of ourselves even more so than ever with all this COVID stuff and these highly contagious uh, pandemics that we have seen either before, um, you know, after COVID-19 hit with a Delta variant, no telling what's coming. Sure. We should really be taking care of our bodies so we can fight any of those germs off. And um, I've learned a lot about that, but that's a whole nother area in pageant competition is fitness. And, you know, what you put in your, your body and mm -hmm. how, you know, like today, I just, I like to walk. So I walk around our farm, mm -hmm. little things like that. You learn a lot. So when it comes to being truly successful in the areas of fitness, in the areas of knowing how to dress, which that's what that pageant world teaches you, yes. communicating and then taking care of yourself. To me, it's life on steroids. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. And let me tell you something. People always yeah. say to me, well, you're a singer, blah, blah. And um, I said, yeah, you know, I've developed that talent, but we have in our little community, my aunt Naomi Herlong could bake a caramel cake like you wouldn't believe. And she yeah. never had a beater. She'd use her hand and a big spoon and she could tell the consistency of the icing. It wow. was amazing. Well, she entered the Grange competition way back, probably in the 30s. Mm -hmm. And we 
continued in our little harmony community to win these competitions. And one was baking, you know, just a cake. Well, all of that combined, our little community was given a Grange building and it was really for agriculture. But now our little Harmony United Methodist Church, that's our fellowship hall. And one of her gifts helped make that happen. No gift is too small. As a nurse, I know you know that. <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. It's just a great story. It is. It is. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. It's time for a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue our conversation. At Open Pages Publishing, we offer coaching, marketing packages, and other professional writing services such as resume, articles, copywriting services, press releases, social media, and blog posting. For more information, email us at info at openpagespublishing.com. And now back to our show. Okay. So I read uh, on your website that your husband's name, I believe is Thomas. It is. And how did you meet him? I think it's an interesting story. <laughs> well, it really is quite interesting. And I can't even tell my children. I can't say you better date and you better learn that person and take your time. Cause that's not what happened to us. <laughs> well, I was Miss Charleston. And one of my first appearances was at the uh, Francis Marion Hotel right on King and Calhoun downtown. And my mother went with me. And this nice looking man stood up, guy, and said, please welcome the newly crowned Miss Charleston like that. And mama said, did you hear that? I went, I did, mama. He dropped his R. So we always love the men, the Southern men that drop the R's, you know, that's yeah. so Southern. And so later, maybe it was intriguing to me. I We needed judges for the Miss Charleston pageant. And I knew he judged beauty pageants. So I called him and I knew we farmed. So here I oh. gave him the phone call. I was a little, like I said, intrigued. And the first thing I said was, well, what have you been doing? I was trying to be mature beauty queen, which you know, mm -hmm. was a problem for me to be mature, period. <laughs> and I said, well, what have you been doing? And he said, and I quote, artificially inseminating my beef cattle. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm not that kind of girl, you know, like, oh my gosh, like, where do you go from here? Yeah. So, so then I went on and won the Miss South Carolina pageant, went to Miss America. And after I got back, my business manager said, Jane Thomas Herlong said, you could sit by him at this banquet. I can't escort you. She had a conflict. And I said, well, Rita, was her name, does he know I'm in a relationship with an astronaut? Nice, cute guy. He's, oh my gosh. And she said, yes. And he's dating someone too. And I said, well, who's his little country girlfriend? <laughs> does she, you know, does she work at the grocery store or the stockyard? And she, Rita said, no, his little country girlfriend is the girl that beat you. She is Miss America. Oh so he was dating Miss America. <laughs> And I loved, I loved her. Cheryl Pruitt from Mississippi. Oh my gosh. She was the mm. best. But I thought I can't lose twice. Come on now. So <laughs> we sat down by each other, Michelle, and I had prayed that God would quicken my heart when the right person that I should marry, I met him and I could just hear ding, 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 ding. It's the daily double. Yeah. This is the guy. So we did not see each other all week. I was working for an agricultural company called Alice Chalmers. I was their spokesperson. I was doing my beauty queen stuff. And mm -hmm. we talked on the phone, no cell phones back then. And when I landed in Columbia, he met me and I knew he was going to propose. We had just headed off. And I thought, well, he's going to take me to the nicest restaurant in Columbia, South mm -hmm. Carolina, be five star, be fabulous. Mm -hmm. And he takes me to a little meet and three called the Lizard's Thicket. Oh my. Yeah. And uh, lo and behold, he asked me to marry him. And I said, yes. And then wow. I said, where do you live? I had no idea where he lived. And so I call this in between because he, I said, I never live in a small town because my cousins do. Mm -hmm. And I said, where do you live with the ring on? And he oh. said, um, in between. And I thought, oh, in oh between. My. But it's such a sweet place, Johnston. It mm -hmm. is. It is an in-between place. It's a very sweet place. The people are great. And, you know, you just fall in love with that small town environment. Sure. So that's that's how we met. 
Oh, isn't that, that's so interesting. <laughs> you, you didn't win, but you won, so. <laughs> yeah, Tara, but I did win Miss America, but I married her boyfriend. That's right. <laughs> that's awesome. And then when I went to sing for Miss Mississippi, mm -hmm. she was the girl that was Miss America. Cheryl was at the pageant. And I told Thomas, I said, she's going to say something to me. He said, no, she won't. I said, I bet you she will. She's very Southern. So mm -hmm. I walk in that old auditorium in Vicksburg and I heard, thanks for stealing my boyfriend. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I knew she's going to say something. Yeah, she's awesome. I love her. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so you decided, you know, you, you did, you sing and then you decided to go into humor. Um, as funny as I think I can be sometimes, I don't think I could really stand up and be intentionally funny. So how do you stand up and be intentionally funny? Well, first you hire a humor coach that tells you if it's oh. funny or not. <laughs> so my good friend, he's actually from Florida, Lou Heckler. Uh, not a funny last name to be a humor coach. But I was also a student of Jeannie Robertson and Jeannie passed away in um, August. Gosh, what a loss. Um, but she was incredible with her stories. And we consider ourselves humorists instead of comedians. Mm -hmm. Although I do say the word comedian a lot of times because mm -hmm. I kind of shift back and forth. Humorists tell long stories, not, not long necessarily, but, and they have funny points and funny words. And we, mm -hmm. we learn how to craft those stories. And like when I'll call, we'll go see my friend Lou and we'll go through all these things and he'll help me. And sometimes I use them. Sometimes I don't. I remember mm -hmm. watching the Jerry Seinfeld on um, at the, the show about him writing comedy and it was totally brilliant. I mean, he had all these manila folders and they went all the way down the street. He was sitting right in the middle and that's what you do. You right. write and write and write and you might say, Oh yeah, that was a funny story. I need to use that. But a lot of times, Michelle, when I'm doing my, my platform work for mm -hmm. associations and corporate folks, I will do an extensive questionnaire and I will find out from that what stories I need to incorporate. So mm -hmm. I just pull them out from where in whether in my brain or I, the stuff I just go back and listen to some of the bits that are on serious. You know what? That would be great for this group. I just spoke mm -hmm. for our school board. So I knew to tell school stories. I knew that that would resonate with them. I've got a <laughs> I've got a friend of mine that's in the choir with me in our little church. And she retired. And I said, what are you doing? She said, well, I just feel like a dummy. I've gone back to substitute teach. And she said, I had a little class of children. And I went and I said, boys and girls, I'm your substitute teacher. And one of the little girls ran to the reading lab the second period and said, guess what? Our real teacher's sick. But today we got a prostitute teacher. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> So I will tell stories like that. And you have to be careful because we live in a culture where people can get offended so easily. And you've got to go and stay in that lane that, you know, you're going to win. They're going to win. and Everybody's going to be happy and nobody's going to throw something out at you. Um, I was mm -hmm. speaking up in, in Minnesota and I just told a cute little story and I offended two people. Oh, like no. I'm going get a life. That's a funny story. So, <laughs> so you know, you just and I'll tell you that one. But you know, I, and I, and I'm careful, and and I guess it does quicken me that, you know, that as a humorist, sometimes you think, okay, I'm gonna throw this in, mm -hmm. but you have to get them to a, a place of they're just laughing, okay. and then then I always say, oh, maybe I shouldn't tell this one, but I tell about a friend of mine who teaches children who's parents are in prison and she okay. loves these kids. And so she said they, but they know too much. They know a lot of slang terms. So mm -hmm. she's talking to him after spring break and said, boys and girls, I was eating breakfast and there was a snake wrapped around the leg of my kitchen table. And this little boy said, well, what did you do? She said, well, I ran next door to get the hoe. He said, well, what did she do? Oh. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I know. I, you know, I thought it was funny, but yeah. so a lot of times you kind of think, will this work with this crowd? And you sure. run it by the meeting planner that strokes the check. And right. Like, oh, right. That's a good one, you know. <laughs> but that's true. Everybody's feelings are hurt today. I mean, you can uh -huh. hardly breathe without uh, annoying somebody or hurting somebody's feelings. You know, it's such a shame. 
Now, when I was being trained uh, as a speaker under John Maxwell team, we, you know, learned that you would have to practice for hours and hours and hours and hours just for a 20 minute talk. So what is your uh, rehearsal time like? Same kind of thing. Hours and hours writing, even stuff I know to the back of my hand. I, you still have to go over it again, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I record it. I listen to it. I, I'm, it's a science. You, I don't pause. I might step on a laugh line. I might switch a word around. Uh, it is truly, it's a deep dive when you're doing copy and delivery and how like words are funnier. Like two is not as funny as nine or five. Right. You know, if you're saying so, there, there are numbers that are funny. There are words that are funny. And I just run it by a lot of my speaker friends. And I'll say, is this funny? How can I make this funnier? And so they'll say, oh, whoa, 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 wait, I got an idea. And so we bounce it off each other. Oh, that's great. We so practice like crazy. We really do. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, it's, it's, you can never practice enough. I know for myself, when I get up to speak in front of an audience, it's kind of like, where was I going with this? You know, <laughs> and you do, you practice, 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 but then you, you get off on another tangent. And, and I know, you know, a lot of people have that shiny object syndrome and, and all of a sudden they're, they're flying over this way or they're flying over this way. And, and the whole speech just goes a different way. I know, um, I know it's true. I mean, my son gives me a lot of funny material because I had a, a client call me and say, you need to look at your website. And I thought, how can somebody hack into my website? You know, that's mm -hmm. that password. But they came through some plugins oh, and they yeah. read to me what they were reading is corrected. Thank goodness. It, said, it was Viagra. Oh, my. Jane, Jane's an expert in Viagra. She travels the Viagra <laughs> and speaks for Viagra. I'm going, oh, you know, so I'm on chat with the um, <laughs> with the site ground guy. And my son calls me. He's very funny. Mm -hmm. And he said, what you doing, mama? <laughs> well, if you must know, Viagra has hijacked my website. And he walked off and said, you trying to get it back up? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I wasn't even thinking of what he was saying. Right. And he said, well, mama, has this been going on for more than four hours? I said, I don't know. He said, you know, we'll do permanent damage. I said, shut your mouth. So <laughs> That's I did a, good. Yeah. So he gives me a lot of material. So I was doing a theater show and our minister came to see. Oh. Me and I just said, OK, now, and I, and I knew she was right. And I said, all right, now you got to let me do this one. And I said, don't don't get too mad at me for this. You know, so then that's a funny that's a funny setup too. our my ministers here. Blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I just I, I just keep collecting and my son Holmes. He gives me a lot of good stuff, I have to admit. That's great. So <laughs> how can people get in touch with you? Well, they can go to Jane uh, at JaneHerlong.com or Jane Jenkins Herlong at gmail.com or just go to my website, JaneHerlong.com or go to my YouTube channel. I have been working so hard on that. Oh, just changing out graphics, putting keywords in subscribe. There's some funny stuff that I put out. And I'm open for speaking engagements, for comedy, slash, I call them the Sweet Tea Tour. <laughs> I'm on um, SiriusXM, Spotify, iTunes, and Amazon Alexa. When I say, play Jane Herlong, I'll go, oh, my gosh, there's my song. So, <laughs> so then my website has product. Amazon, of course, has the books. Um, you can get Target, Walmart, Barnes & Noble. Um, all those places carry my books. The new one, I'm excited about it. i got to show you the picture. It's really, really cute. I don't know if you can see that. Sweet tea oh. secrets from the deep fried South. Oh, that's awesome. Isn't I that love the cute? That. And I will tell you, you the pictures that they put in there, knock yes. your socks off. I couldn't believe the gorgeous low country pictures. And my daddy had about 8,000 and I'm not exaggerating slides. Mm -hmm. Slides. I went through every one when they, because I would write a story and they'd say, can you prove that? And I went, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd send him a picture. <laughs> it's, now it's, I it's a good book. Good. Good. Look forward to it. So I got to ask, I know when we were children, we had big family gatherings like we talked about earlier. And at the end of the family gathering, you had to go around and hug and kiss every relative. Did you have to do that? 
oh gosh, yeah, you got to go see them. You know, like I'd come home from when my grandparents were very elderly and I just went to see my aunt and uncle the other day. Whenever I'm around my elderly aunts and uncles, I always love to go see them. They don't, they don't know me a lot of times, you know, mm-hmm. comes and goes, but they're in their nineties. But oh yeah, I still do that. I, I I learned the value of that beautiful library of older mm-hmm. people. And my and one of the last chapters in my book, Michelle, is called John's Island Royalty, and it's about Miss Ada Seabrook Rast. And mm-hmm. I would go see Miss Ada because she was my mama's one of her last friends. And we would reminisce. And when she passed away, I sang at her funeral. I was so honored. So, um, yeah, I believe in all that hugging and kissing and um, <laughs> and really celebrating your cousins and your aunts and your nephews, your nieces, your great. I just had my great niece and nephew spend the night with me. They're college students, one's in law school. It was so much fun because they're learning, too that it's a treasure. Mm-hmm. Family is a treasure. Now, some people in our family, we might not want to hug and kiss and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Just shake their hand or bump their elbow and say, good right. to see you. My psychology professor taught me to do that. <laughs> you don't have to do the conversation. Say, good to see you. That's all you need to do. Be nice. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we sometimes have those relatives, you know, that they have the big thing at you right here in the front or right over here. <laughs> And it'd be like, do we have to, Mom? You know. <laughs> of course you had to, and that's something. Kiss that relative and make and make it feel special. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's so, sad, honey. So what do you have going on right now? Well, I'm working on a speech that I'm doing this weekend at the Charlotte Motor Speedway with a good friend of mine, Jeffrey Gittimer, who's brilliant. So we're going to be talking about I how to deliver a keynote, how to craft a keynote. Then I have another speech I'm doing for a group. I've got a couple more speeches coming up, some platform work, um, conventions and things. And Mm -hmm. I'm actually in the Speaker Hall of Fame. This is this is a great honor. I'm very excited. But I'm I'm the chair this year. So we're starting our process of inducting more folks into the Hall of Fame. So I'm working hard with that, trying to get a Hall of Fame speaker channel under the National Speakers Association. So I'm really involved in that. I'm I'm on a college board. I'm involved with that. But I try to balance it all between the shows and the convention work and the writing. And I've even you'll love this, Michelle. You will absolutely love this. I am getting magnetic signs made for my car and it's going to be advertising my book. Oh, that's great. I know. I'm thinking, why not? I mean, I've got less time and I've got less time in front of me than I do. You know, I have more time behind me. So I'm thinking, you know, this last leg of my life, I'm going to keep working it. And I don't care anymore. I just that's don't. right. That's so right. I'm keep moving that. forward. That's right. You just can't you can't stop trying and you can't try stopping is what Dolly Parton always said. Just keep moving. Just keep moving. Keep moving. So this is this is kind of a two part question. What is the best advice you were ever given? And then what is the best advice you can give to somebody looking to do maybe something like you're doing? The best advice I've been given would have to be from my parents telling me to always be myself. Because when you put yourself out there and it's uncomfortable and you're challenging yourself, you I always remember the voice of Jane B. Yourself. And rely on that because that will carry you through. And it does. You put one step in front of the other. And I was talking about being with John Maxwell at Mm -hmm. High Point University with a ribbon cutting. And I loved it. I was backstage with Lee Greenwood. What a wonderful guy. My my good friend, Dr. Nito Cobain, a couple of friends and us, we all were in this round in this beautiful new arena, Nito in the Mariana Cobain Center, just to stand up there, Michelle, and to be surrounded by about 7,000 people singing, you know, I could have cowered and gone, no, no, Nito, I can't do that. I'm going, yeah, I can't wait. (laughs) So if somebody wants to do what I'm doing, fight the fear, have the courage, tell yourself, look at yourself in the mirror and say, give it a try, give it a try. Because if it doesn't work out, I guarantee you another door will open. Have the courage to walk through that first door and then you'll see another door and then you see another door. I mean, I started singing in churches, recording gospel music. And then all of a sudden I thought, you know, I could speak to these kids. My brother, bless his heart, struggled with drug addiction. I can tell them about that. And then all of a sudden I joined national speakers and I think, oh, my gosh, this is a candy store. I can be a convention (laughs) speaker. 
I can travel all over the country and the world. I've been in New Zealand and Germany. So yeah. accept the challenge. Don't tell yourself no. And don't let people tell you no. Don't let people tell you no. Listen to your heart. I mean, I had to struggle to get through college. Couldn't get into college. So I went to, I drove to this little Methodist women's college in Columbia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Talked to the admissions director. He said, Jane, you know, I just, I just don't think that, you know, your college material. I said, you give me a chance. So I think that's the mindset you have to have. Just push through and see what happens. You'd never know. That is great advice. Great advice. So it's been wonderful having you on the show. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell my listeners? Well, I guess the best thing is if anybody ever wants to get in touch with me and we can have a chat, I love to help people. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe in always learning, continuously learning. And I think that being that we are coming out of a very difficult time in our country, I hope there'll be a lot of folks who just really and truly start living their dreams, making it happen mm -hmm. and moving forward. And I'm, I'm one person that believes in the power of prayer and the yes. power of, of believing that you can do whatever the next step is and just keep moving in that direction. And don't be the person who sits on the front porch and regrets what a bad life ending that would be. Always celebrate who you are. My good friend Larry Winkett says it like this, expect the best, prepare for the worst and celebrate it all. And that's a good way to live. It is. It is. And you know, there's a, a new song out and, and it has something to do with um, not having the what ifs. Stop oh, having the what that. if, mm -hmm. you know, it's so important to stop having those, you know, what if I would have tried out for that pageant? What if I would have, you know, taken the risk and writ written that book? You know, what if? And, and you'll never know if you don't try. And I believe that we're in a, a generation, our younger generation right now, uh, I'm, I'm not sure they're strong enough to stand on their own and then move forward. Well, I think as good as electronic media has helped us and we grasp mm -hmm. the, the joy and what it can do for us. I think a lot of these kids have depended on it to the point where they're just socially crippled. Yes. And uh, that's what you're seeing now. And I know you write about this in, in your mm -hmm. books, but mm -hmm. our superintendent in our schools, he talks about the fifth grader that's now the seventh grader. And they just don't have, they don't have skills and they don't have the education. They, right. They've missed that one year and it's a big year. So that is a problem. Is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been so much fun and I can't wait for your new book. Thank you, Michelle. We can pre-order on Amazon. Yay. Or other places too. I okay. think. Coach and tell us, tell us the name again. Sweet Tea Secrets from the Deep Fried South. And it's, with sassy, sacred Southern stories filled with hope and humor. <laughs> That's wonderful. It's sassy. It's more sassy than anything. <laughs> I like to be sassy. That's it, You have to be. You have to be. Yeah, today. sure. Well, thank you again so much. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it a lot. It's been fun. Okay. And if you'd like to be a guest or a sponsor for the show, please reach out to me at info at openpagespublishing.com. This is Michelle Spicanis reminding you to live the life you were meant to live.